Our next guest is a digital creator you might have seen on your For You page. Take a look. Polling is such an inexact science and frequently wrong and cannot predict for new voters or young voters. This is why I stay under the desk and I don't try to predict what's going to happen. Just get out and vote for who you believe in. With us today is V Spear, who's changing the landscape of news by taking complex issues and making them easy to digest with their TikTok series, Under the Desk. Today, V's here to talk all about journalism and TikTok, food and family. This is Advocate Now. I'm so excited to talk to you, V. You've been creating TikTok videos for a few years now, but take me back to the beginning. What initially drew you to the platform? So it was the beginning of the pandemic, right? And everyone was getting on TikTok to try and make connections, entertain each other, share information about what was going on with the pandemic, maybe some of our best cooking recipes. And for me, it felt like a really great time to help deliver the news to people in a way that wasn't so scary. So much of the information we were getting was really intense, really hard to follow, really difficult to keep up on. And I thought, I'm just going to get under my desk. We're going to create a safe space to talk about difficult things in a kind way. You first started by making culinary videos, right? So how did that start? And then how did you transition into the news related content? So I was working for the James Beard Foundation at the time as the director of impact and women's leadership programs. And uh, I had been a chef previously and I knew how to cook and I loved making cooking content and throwing the butter and doing all that goofy stuff. And when the PPP loans started, of course, the culinary industry we don't deal with that kind of stuff on the regular government funding and grants. And so I started making videos to try and explain the resources that were available for things like shuttered venues and the PPP loans and, and stuff that was available to send um, protective gear to restaurants so that they could keep doing their to-go orders and stuff like that. So that's how I started to bridge between culinary and advocacy or you know government program stuff. Obviously, the news can be overwhelming. We get a lot of information thrown at us on a daily basis, but your Under the Desk series provides easy to understand explainers of what's going on. Why was that important to you to, to keep it simple? So I always feel left out of the conversation, right? I, I, it's always felt to me like the news is for really smart people and the Wall Street Journal and stuff like that is for folks who have finance degrees. And it turns out we are all a lot smarter than we give ourselves credit for and we can understand these things. And the thing that I wanted to bring to people is like, yes, there are people who understand something and they want to talk at, about it at a very high political level, but then there's just the average person who's like, okay, what happened? What does this mean for me? What do I need to do anything? Do I need to be scared? Do I need to take action on this? Is this my time? Or is this something I need to be aware of? But it's not something that I directly can have much influence on at this point. And I love that you're doing all of it literally under a desk in your series. What was the significance of that initially? How did you come up with that idea? So I wanted to create a space that was different from what you're used to seeing. I didn't want people to think that I was a real serious journalist at a news desk telling you things the way that they might expect to see on TV or something like that. I was a citizen journalist who was a little bit scared, and I was going to create this space under the desk for us to have conversations about things that are hard to hear about, hard to understand. But in creating that kind of blanket fort world, it's like, okay, we can come here, we can talk about this thing, we can take away what matters to us, and then we can go back to the regular world. And so that was the point of Under the Desk. Your authenticity really shines in your videos, which I'm sure is one of the many reasons people love watching you so much. How much of a role has that played in your success thus far, would you say? I feel a great responsibility to the folks who follow me. And while there are almost 3 million of them now, I promise you I could tell you every single one of their names if I had to. I think it's such a great platform, TikTok, in that you can have so many conversations. So I'm not just like putting out the news on my side. I'm looking at the comments. I'm reading the DMs. People who follow are sending in stories and things they're interested in. We're getting a lot of local news, which local news has been near destroyed over the last decade. And we need to get that on the ground, small story back on a national stage because the issues that are affecting somebody in Northwest Arkansas, surprisingly, are also affecting somebody in Rochester, New York. We can learn from each other and feel less alone. It can be information overload with all the news headlines each day. That can make it tough for people to know, you know, what's real, what's fake. So how do you represent journalistic integrity in your videos? What steps do you take to make sure that you're providing accurate information? 
I think what's great about my show is it's only one minute. So I have the I have the ability to really look and say, what is mandatory to talk about right now? What is the thing that is most affecting the average person? What is the thing people are most curious about? What is the interesting, to quote my podcast, about these news stories? So I don't cover everything. And I made a promise to my audience up front that I wasn't going to cover certain topics that I'm not an expert on. Like I don't cover a ton of foreign correspondence, but I can oftentimes bring in a guest who is an expert on that. And I think letting people people know where I'm an expert and where I'm bringing in a friend to pick up that that story and give you the, the right and legit information has built a lot of trust, but it's also built a lot of community. So I think being one minute a night is really helpful um, to not having to try to fill a full day of programming. Absolutely. You mentioned your podcast, Be Interesting. How does that differ from your Under the Desk series on TikTok? So one thing about me is I'm a newspaper girl. Like, I love the newspaper and I love the idea of like, yes, we've got our front page that's getting me excited. That's sort of like letting me know exactly the things that folks have pretty much decided is the most important thing in a lot of ways. But those page two, page three, page seven stories, that's where the real heart of what's going on in the world is happening. So on Be Interesting, what we try to do is say, we recognize you probably got the headlines. If you listen to Be Interesting podcast, you probably also watch Under the Desk on TikTok, probably also a pretty educated person in a lot of other ways interested in these topics. Let me tell you about some goofy stuff that's going on also in the world that isn't just continuing to reiterate, reiterate a certain narrative and like bombard somebody with all of the biggest, baddest headlines. It's like, no, there's a lot of people doing cool, interesting stuff out there. So on Be Interesting, we tend to dig into the stories that don't get as much attention, but are very interesting to the average person. I love that. We all want to know what's your secret? I mean, how do you make TikTok content that people want to watch? I make it because I love to. I, I really do think that that's it. I think if to be successful on TikTok, you have to really love it. And I'm just addicted to it. I wake up in the morning and I'm excited to see what my friends and my mutuals, as we call them, have created, uh, whether that's overnight or that morning. I'm excited to see what comments have come in. I'm excited to share stories with people. You can go live or you can have a two-way conversation. And I think that's what makes TikTok such a wonderful platform is that ability to build citizen journalist networks. And I've got like Taylor Lorenz sometimes from the Washington Post, arguably one of the most notable reporters right now who will jump in from time to time. So we're seeing a crossover of legacy media and the TikTok citizen journalist. We've got Max Foster from CNN who pops by every so often with a comment. I think it's such a great place for people to have this sandbox to play in that we don't have in the real world. I am so blown away by your success and everything that you've built. I want to pivot to talking about food because as if you yeah. weren't busy enough, you work to help increase food security in Baltimore. You held the title of Director of Impact for Women and LGBTQIA plus programs at the coveted James Beard Foundation. You're also on the board of Rainbow Families. Tell us about that. So food is really at the center of democracy. I think that is the one thing that you know everybody says will bond us, everybody has to eat. But if you look at the way that a food system works in a city, you can really tell a lot about the politics of that city and the community of that city and where we can um, fix things, make things better for folks. So food has always played a role in how I see the world, You know, whether that's social dining, like at the James Beard Foundation, or whether that was my work with Hungry Harvest in Baltimore. And so, I've maintained this one foot in the food systems world because it's something that I cannot ever stop doing. It's something I care genuinely about and I think is important to really grounding all of the rest of the news that we're getting is like, are people eating? Simple as that. And if they're not, why aren't they? And, and if we could figure out why they aren't, then how can we fix that? And I think that's something that's going to not only be a cornerstone of democracy going forward, but is a place where people can really start to share ideas, no matter who they voted for, because we can all agree that people deserve to eat and they deserve to eat the best quality food that we can produce, ideally here in the United States. A lot of our food is imported. Let's bring that back home. These are ways that we can build together. We can get our hands dirty together. And so it's a world that I can never leave and that I'm so passionate about. And with Rainbow Families, this is a not-for-profit organization that helps people un helps people build a family if you're a queer person. So it could be adopting queer adult children or children that identify as LGBTQ, but it's also for LGBTQ families. When I was a kid, I didn't have a lot of representation to show me that having a family was going to be possible for me. It just wasn't something that in the 80s and 90s, I saw a lot of examples of. So what Rainbow of Families does is teach you all those skills that you might not have thought about before, about going through the adoption process, about what it is like to have a, a same-sex family and, and building community around that. So 
these are the places that I care most about. And they do tend to focus around like food and family. Well, you are definitely doing amazing things. You're having important conversations. V, thank you so much for everything you're doing and for say, taking some time to talk with us as well. Thank you so much, Sonia. I appreciate you bringing me on. I'm Sonia Bang Daddy. Thanks for watching and advocating. For more stories and content like this, visit advocatechannel.com.